Okay, I have 10 o'clock Second Life time. Uh, what would kind of be interesting is if Second Life had been created in another country. Instead of it being Pacific time, now it would be some other time or universal time or something that would be interesting. But since it's uh, with San Francisco, it's um, 8 o'clock. Okay, uh, today I am going to present at very 2 a.m. Yes, local time. Uh, really? Wah. Okay, I did a presentation earlier, by the way, uh, for um, people, if they were able to. Oh, my goodness. Okay, all over the place. It's galactic standard time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. How about Mars time, right? Um, okay. So today I'm going to present on a topic that's been fascinated to fa that I have found fascinating for some time, uh, which is the idea of analog computing. So the first thing I need to do is kind of look at what we mean by analog and digital. The, this is a computer today. Um, and I will talk a little bit about what we mean by a digital computer. Now, one of the reasons we're doing this is, first of all, welcome. Uh, we haven't done this uh, perhaps for a little while, but if you're new to the Science Circle, welcome. And we present uh, people all over the world uh, do presentations to people all over the world. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so digital one and zero. Now, in the case of digital, it really means discrete numbers. So in the case of computers, it's binary ones and zeros, but we could mean simply uh, numbers um, and nothing in between. In other words, a two uh, and then a three and nothing in between, and that would mean digital. Well, you're right. It, it goes back to fingers and toes, although we've had other bases. So, for example, decimal is base 10, although our time system and such with 60 seconds, 60 minutes is back uh, Babel, Babylonian base 60. And then you've got, uh, what, what's it called, VESA digital or VESA decimal uh, base 20. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. But in any case, the computers today are based on a digital system, particularly binary, uh, particularly electricity on and off. Yeah, there you go, base 60. And then what's the, there's a, there's a vest of whatever, uh, base 20 that was used in the Americas and also by the Celts. Um, so in any case, uh, let's distinguish between, thank you, uh, let's distinguish between digital and analog. So let's just say this is a digital computer. And one of the things we're doing, by the way, in the science circle and here is, uh, well, analog to me, when I think of analog is, and I'll, I'll show you here, is this is analog. In other words, continuous movement, uh, each increment of movement means, we think of it as mechanical because analog is a well there's digital and analog but analog is a very natural sort of thing uh, where continuous movement and every part of that movement has meaning whereas in digital devices only as i mentioned only specific increments like numbers have meaning and anything in between is is not uh, yes, and we're actually going to talk about that a little bit. In other words, up until around the 1970s. Um, so, in any case, one of the things also about us being here is that we have to understand how these systems work, or somebody does anyway, because if digital computers are very nice and the business model and technology have advanced to the point where all we have to do is our fingers click and move and drag and such. And so billions of people are able to work with them without any understanding whatsoever of what's going on inside. But somebody has to understand what's going on inside. In the days of, uh, in these days when we had watches and stuff, not everybody had to understand what was going on inside, but the designers of analog devices like this fine watch or 
other devices that I'll talk about had to understand uh, numbers, uh, relationships uh, between them, uh, translate that into physical distances, um, and uh, I, as someone pointed out the last time, or the last presentation, it was really quite a, um, actually the presentation today is about the difference between analog computers and digital, these guys right here, okay? So we're going to be talking about more like uh, the ones that look like this, analog devices over the years. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so let me show you a simple device. Now, you could think of this as what? Is this digital or analog? I like the commentaries from the audience there. Is this digital? Is this analog? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, that may be more precise. <laughs> is, uh, yes, the, the, definitely the concept is digital. And I'm sorry I can't read that, but I like it that you're talking in another language. I wish I could read that. Um, the only reason I'm talking in English is because I can't read that or speak it. <laughs> Otherwise, I would. I'd love to be able to do this in more than one language. Um, I hope some of you guys will, as a matter of fact. Well, let's, let's say that it's a mechanical device, but the concept is digital. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, let's look at what this is. This is a device that's been around for many years, in fact, um, a couple thousand years. And because one of the things is if you look, and yes, it is a decimal system. In other words, it has numbers uh, from one to nine, at least. Uh, by the way, it doesn't have a zero. Zeros were not invented back in the Roman days. Uh, it was invented uh, basically uh, Hindu. It's a Hindu invention of the, um, I think about a thousand years ago. Somebody want to look that up? when the zero was invented. Uh, but in any case, if you look, uh, there's a replica up on the upper left of an abacus from the Roman Empire. So these are not recent devices, and they're also worldwide. You can see they're from lots of different places. Essentially, let's take a look at what they, um, yes, I, I think so too. Essentially, let's take a look at how these work by looking at the one on the bottom right, and you can see how uh, uh, clever uh, it is. Is Essentially, what it is a mechanical device, so what it does is it uses particularly uh, the width of the, and not width, I mean width along the, excuse me, height, width, whatever, the width along the, the line that contains the beads or, or the counters on there. So if you look on the bottom right, uh, the configuration that is used in Japan, you'll see that if you, also with gravity, if you leave it like this and all the counters, um, well, maybe not gravity. Okay, but in any case, if you, look at, if you leave the counters the way they are on the far left, that those are zeros. And then if you want to represent a one, you just click up one against the stop in the middle. And you don't have to worry about fine movement, you just click it up, click, okay? If you want to do a two, uh, you click up the next one. If you want to do a three, you can see that in the third row from the left there, one, two, three, click, click, click. And four, of course, would be four up. And then the real clever thing about this one is that if you want to do a five, you just take the whole thing and wham, you click it down, starting from the top. And so the top one becomes a five, and then the four that were above it get clicked down. You can kind of imagine this. And then you go six. In other words, you leave the five down and you go click six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, I've actually seen, the one I saw in action was looked a lot like the one uh, to the bottom left, which was I was in Russia about 20 years ago, and they were using abacuses in the store in place of calculators. Uh, and that was, and I, and they were very fast. I mean, I've, people with calculators, with abacuses can calculate as fast as you can on a little handheld calculator or on possibly your iPhone or something. Um, and I was quite amazed uh, that they're able to calculate 
uh, the basic things you would need for in a store. Okay, so this is a device from uh, many years ago. And essentially, like I said, it's a mechanical device, but it's really a digital calculator. Okay, so let's take a look at this next device. Anyone seen this before? Anybody recognize this? I've got the name up there, but really what that is, is that me, that's a device that was found in an island off of uh, the Greek island of Antikythera, which, by the way, was opposite Kythera Island. That's what the Antikythera means. Anybody know how old this is? Yeah, this is definitely an analog computer. Uh, it was pretty sophisticated. Yeah. Um, somewhere around there, in other words, they think it's around 100 BCE, so that would put it at, um, what, 2100 years or more, but that's amazing for a device like that. Now, it didn't look like the one on to the right, the bottom right, obviously, that's a reproduction of it. Right now, unfortunately, it looks like what it looks like up to upper left, but using x-rays and a bunch of other things, they found out that, oh my goodness, this is a very sophisticated device that used to look like one down to the bottom. Uh, and the actual diagram in the middle there shows how the different gearing such worked in it. And as an analog device, they are very interested in the movement of the sun and the planets and the moon and such. And so this one actually is able to track and depict where the sun is. Well, for astrology and lots of other uh, purposes, um, remember that the word is that astrology was kind of the study of what's out there beyond us before the scientific astronomy came around. And so you've got, uh, but also the idea that the planets and extraterrestrial bodies uh, ruled things on Earth. And that's how they have the names of gods and goddesses. We were talking about that in trivia just recently here. I mean, in some of the trivia questions. Um, so you've got um, this device able to uh, track and depict the path of the sun and the planets and the phases of the moon. So they understood uh, relationship-wise that if you could track where the moon was and the phases and where the sun was and such, you could also predict solar eclipses. Now that was pretty special to be able to say, tomorrow the sun is going to be, have a shadow in front of it uh, uh, from the, uh, excuse me, the, yeah, um, from the moon. Um, they could also predict equinoxes and solstices. Uh, there was a calendar in here, the Olympic years. So this is a very sophisticated uh, mechanical analog computer from that time period. Okay, let's take a look at another one and see. Now, this is one that not that many people know about. Uh, anyone seen this one before? The word kipu is actually a... Uh, oh, oh, I've got a bunch of text here that I have been failing to put here. So if you aren't picking up everything that I have or that I have been saying. I could have been putting it up there. So now they have also discovered fairly recently that the ancient Chinese and Hawaiians also had different knot systems. Uh, kipu in this case means like knot or talking knots. So the devices had um, meaning both in color and position. Now think of what it actually did, is that, for example, this was a database. It was almost like, yeah, it could store data anyway. And so this was like a database. It's, for example, what if you wanted to go around down a road? Think of, the, think of that uh, baseline uh, piece of rope as a road. And you go down the road and you meet these little villages and you go into the village and you count how many young men there are for the army and how many sheep they have and people and uh, so you can uh, do tax records and census records and uh, store all kinds of information uh, depending on the knots and how many where the positioning of the knots and there was actually 
a numbering system based on where the knots were along the, the rope and such. It was very um, uh, sophisticated for the day. And this was down in uh, South America. Um, yeah, okay. I didn't know about that. That's, that's good. Thank you for sharing. Okay, this device, anyone familiar with this one? Well, now that's, a, that's an interesting point, uh, Castle, is that the origin of writing, I was thinking about that myself, and since I have a moment here, I think I'm a little ahead because I didn't put the text earlier, but um, the actual origin of writing, if you look back at the Phoenicians and other peoples of that area at the time is that, and some of the earlier empires, uh, Babylonians and, well, uh, much earlier than that, Sumerians and such, is that, uh, yeah, exactly, is that writing began kind of, in fact, actually, uh, if you don't mind, let me just pop in what I know about it, is that the, is they needed to keep track of things uh, for their own purposes, like taxes and whatever. And so they would make a little clay ball and or vessel and drop little clay balls into it and then seal it and that became the first kind of uh, record of those sorts of things and that would represent the number of people in a village or something and then instead of uh, making the clay vessel with the little balls and dip dropping in it which is kind of uh, difficult because how do you get to the balls you have to break open the little clay vessel and you know it's, so then they decided to make um, symbols for a horse or for a person or for uh, whatever it is they were uh, fishes or something and those then they could press onto clay rather than to make the little clay balls or they could press onto the clay container so now all of a sudden those little symbols represented uh, animals and sometimes some and the and the symbols at one time looked like the animals or the objects, and then pretty soon uh, the symbols became basically represented the sounds of the objects, and much like we have today in in um, at least uh, English and rela related languages, is that some of the symbols actually represent the sounds rather than the objects, but in other parts of the world the symbols represent uh, the objects as well. So, yeah. Yeah, like the hieroglyphs, that was kind of a uh, another thing. But that's very interesting. I'm glad you brought up the idea of, of language. Um, okay, so this particular device uh, was, as we've mentioned before, this one was like the Antikythera device. This one was analog. Well, what we mean by that is that e every movement has a meaning that is you move it a tiny little bit and it represents uh, something well there were digits because you're talking time okay and when you're talking time or you're talking specific places so you can't really distinguish it's it's kind of hard all of these overlap a little bit um as far as whether you it's pure um it well exactly <laughs> that too so i'm i'm not going to, you know, uh, from the semantics of whether it's it, a particularly analog or digital, but the idea is that since you're talking about analog objects like as astronomical objects, uh, those don't like click like seconds on a clock. They, you don't just see Mars going boop and then it goes over a little bit. It, it moves in through the sky in a continuous mo movement. Good, good for us, otherwise the Earth would be, you know, would be jumping every... <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. In other words, we move in a very smooth uh, pattern. Um, so, like the Antikythera device, the astrolabe was used for astronomical observations, which were then used for navigation. Now, consider people that traveled back and forth between Asia and uh, uh, Europe and Northern Africa and such, is that essentially they needed to be able to find latitude they need to be able to find uh, have some idea where they were in a day and night and so they use devices like this in order to be able to do that 
Um, yeah, there you go. In order to be able to do that. And one of the things I find, ha, well, uh, actually the astrolabe then became the sex or, or the, the later version of it became the sextant. And I think when you're talking about uh, Captain Sparrow, he's probably, now that's of course fictional in character there in Hollywood movies, but uh, used a, a sextant, which was kind of a later version of some of these. Um, now what's interesting, I think, about this also is you is the cultural aspect. You could actually see that, first, first of all, the devices all ha depended on gearing and so that you can see one of them broken apart more or less on the upper right and the gears there. But you can also see that uh, the development uh, began in the area that kind of was in the middle between uh, far Asia and far left um, or far west uh, uh, Europe. And the device was passed on, particularly since the Islamic world had the uh, one of the uh, big cities of knowledge of the time, some of the cities in the in that area, including Baghdad and stuff, while Europe was somewhat in the still in the backwater, is that um, there are also people, uh, Jewish people, who were not welcomed in Europe, but they were in the Islamic uh, world, or at least accepted in the Islamic world. So they. Uh, were able to shuttle back and forth uh, between and help to bring some of the technology from the Islamic world. And then, of course, by nature of the Islamic world being between China and Europe, uh, being able to bring knowledge back and forth uh, in addition to um, things like spaghetti. <laughs> I was mentioned that last time, you know, um, and spices, <laughs> other things. Uh, but in any case, if you look at the chronology on there, you've got the early versions and then other versions and then the European versions in uh, in the Middle Ages and uh, into the Renaissance. And they're even made today. I found one uh, here. There's an Iranian version in 20 that was made uh, just five years ago. Um, and they were also used for astronomical observation and then for navigation because they knew where they were. Yeah, I'm, I, yes, all over the things, yes, all over that world. I think one of the things they're finding is more and more that uh, there's a lot of cultural back and forth, maybe more than uh, realized sometimes. Okay, so um, this device is a little closer to the modern time period. Now, this one itself also has a some stories associated with it. And let me put some text up there. Is it essentially, um, yeah, Ada? That exactly. I'm, I'm, I included both people up there because I think that's important. Uh, for one, because I think some people who are important to history uh, have been overlooked by people who write history. Um, the other part is because she actually played a quite a part. We usually think of this, we usually call it the Babbage engine or whatever. Uh, but um, they both played a part, uh, uh, Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace. And let me tell you a little bit about it. Essentially, 200 years ago, when industrial machines were starting to be used um, in the uh, first areas that uh, were part of the industrial age is that he designed a device for calculating polynomial equations. Polynomial equations were used for approximations of all kinds of um, numbers. And the only way else to do it was longhand calculations. In other words, tables of numbers for logarithms and trigonomic nometric values and stuff helped engineers and astronomers and others in order to create uh, some of the machines they needed and calculations they needed. Okay, how many people here, you can raise your hand. I won't see you in Second Life there, but <laughs> you can raise your hand. How many of you guys um, have gone to tables of numbers, whether 
trigonometry, logarithms, statistics. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and it's still used in uh, for p-values and stuff in uh, statistics. I mean, technically, you can run those out yourself, uh, but uh, we still use some of those tables of numbers. And creating tables of numbers back then, we didn't have a cal computer to do it or a calculator. So it's done by hand. And anything done by hand that's time consuming like that, to create a whole book of tables and numbers out to however many decimal places, that's a lot of work. Um, so the idea is that Charles Babbage wanted to create a machine that could do it for you. So you could have one of these machines and uh, do it at the time you needed. And so now he was a little bit ahead of the time. So actually he was only able to do a scale model of what's called the difference engine, which is the one on the left, was built in his time, but a full scale model was uh, required too many gears, too much precise machining, uh, all that stuff. So it wasn't actually realized in his time, but people uh, after he died started working with it. Now, where does Ada Lovelace come in? Well, so Babbage thought of this as a machine to help people to generate uh, astronomical calculations. He, was, he did astronomy and other things, as well as tables of numbers. But Ada Lovelace, when she looked at particularly the drawings for the analytical machine, which was never built, but, well, that's a replica there on the a modern replica, is, yes, there was. In fact, as a matter of fact, when I was in the military in the 1980s, Ada or, uh, was the uh, accepted language, um, computer language. Okay, so in any case, what she looked at is she looks at these machines, yes, and she looks at these machines and she goes, oh my goodness, um, a general digital computer can become a thinking machine. Uh, this is more. And so she was also, in addition to writing some of the first instructions for how this thing works, in other words, she understood the principles and, and wrote them in a way so other people could understand it, is that while Babbage is credited with being kind of the father of the first uh, digital computer, Ada Lovelace is credited with being the first computer programmer and also the first person to realize the what the potential was of general digital computers. So she was uh, probably uh, 100 years ahead of her time as far as um, that goes. Okay, now actually this next one is something I didn't know about. I thought I, I knew about most of, the, of these devices, but when I was doing a little research, um, I found this. Uh, because I wanted to find uh, what was between, say, Babbage's machine and IBM. And I found out, uh, first of all, let's take a look at the machine in the middle. That was called a Pascal calculator. Yeah, there you go. And while, and I don't know whether it was sophisticated, kind of like the one in the middle. In other words, I know it had gearing and such, and it was based on a, um, what's called the Leibniz wheel, which is a stepped wheel that you see up to the upper left. In fact, all calculators, pretty much mechanical ones, even up until into the uh, 20th century had those devices in them to be able to step when you uh, basically crunch the numbers. In other words, things went around and they stepped and moved up numbers and such. And that was developed back in the 1600s. Um, they do. Now, the thing is with the, this is definitely digital and it's definitely, well, okay, it's mechanical, digital, it's, but it's definitely decimal. In other words, uh, 10 uh, digits. Um, <clears throat> the thing, <clears throat> excuse me, the thing is that, <laughs> I don't know, you can figure that one out. <laughs> the um, thing about this is that unlike that big unwieldy machine that Babbage had developed or thought of, this is, um, this is from 1850 to the, about 1900, and this was something that, as you can see, this is kind of like the laptop of calculators, so to speak, of back in the 1900s. 
or 19 or 1800s is because you could actually they they were inexpensive enough and you could yeah you could do uh, basic arithmetic and stuff and you stick the you you sl do the little sliders and you could do big multiplication problems and all all kinds of stuff like that for about 50 years and then uh, the last company that made one of these I read uh, went out of business in 1915 probably because you know uh, we're uh, uh, Europe in particular was pretty occupied in 1915 um, and then you had basically well let me th let me throw up uh, uh, some of the text here because I'm talking talking but for people that uh, would like a more visual uh, backup um, this was called the arithmometer and it was used in from around thing now the reason why you don't see these after World War one time period is it was superseded by calculators that were developed by companies such as the International Business Machines, IBM, in the early 90s. Um, but, and I mentioned that the key to the working mechanism of computers was this, uh, excuse me, was this um, Leibniz wheel that was actually designed in the 1600s. So that's rather interesting. By the way, does anybody know how IBM came into being? For some reason, I've got a little more time than I had on the first presentation, I think, because uh, I had, like, here again, I, if I miss the text, <laughs> I may miss some of the things I need to, or would like to say. Okay. Um, I didn't know that one, but... Essentially, what I tell my students, because when we go over the development of technology and such, is that uh, you can look it up. Let me see. I, I probably have a, a minute to look up a couple things here real quick. Um, does anyone know about uh, this? Let me give you a... Um, here, I'll give you a little... Uh, okay, I'm going to do Wikipedia here. I don't always use uh, that for everything, but um, it's a good uh, general thing. Does anybody know about what's called the Jacquard Loom? Yes, he was. Yeah, they were contemporaries. Essentially, they co-invented uh, calculus and things like that. Okay, so the Jacquard Loom was the first device, and it was early, late 1700s, and what that device did is essentially they said okay uh, just like some of those earlier devices is uh, they were saying in order to weave fabric you need a person and you need a skilled person programmable exactly so you need a skilled person and so couldn't we do this with a machine and so uh, card in um, France um, made punch cards and they stuck the punch cards on the machine the uh, punch cards uh programmed what the weave would be voila you could um and and that's a <laughs> i use voila okay not okay whatever uh so in any case you you make the pattern on the on the weave uh you could do it for inexpensively you don't have to have skilled labor um and like a player piano exactly and so you um are able to make in, more inexpensive items and etc. So that kind of ch set the whole chain in motion. Well, those particular punch cards were later uh, created by, or there was a uh, immigrant to the United States named Herman Hollerith, and he. Let me see. I'm looking up his uh, little computer here. I'm looking. I'm looking for a. Uh, Hollerith cards, punch cards, okay. But in any case, he used punch cards in order to store data. And there we go. Okay, you can look under, if you want, you can look under here. But he's 
it to store data, and particularly for census in the United States in the 1990s. And when they had to go around with like pen and paper, they, it took them seven or eight years to tabulate everything, which in the United States, the census is every 10 years. And they were going, oh, my goodness, by the, yeah, that's how I started uh, programming with punch cards. And so they, they go, oh, my goodness, you know, by the, we, we have so many immigrants coming in uh, that by the next de decade, for example, it may take quite a long time to do the census. And so he goes, okay, um, I, immigrant, uh, Herman Hollerth here, um, uh, how about these little cards? And so he did, he, he created a machine to read the uh, cards. Of course, people had to punch it in and um, able to do the census in about two years, whereas it took three, three years or three times that uh, earlier. And then he created a company with the punch cards and he mer they merged with another company. And the uh, bottom line is that uh, the company became International Business Machines, which was IBM. Okay. Uh, not everybody knows that uh, background, too, but kind of interesting. Okay. So in the early, so 100 years ago, you had companies like uh, International Business Machines and, uh, let's see, what was it, Digital... I was trying to think of a couple other ones that uh, did the uh, uh, electronic, excuse me, first the mechanical calculators and then the electron, electrical ones and such like that. Um, so now in the 1930s, uh, 1940s, uh, when we did, yeah, exactly, DEC, perfect. Yeah, that's what I was looking for is, um, yeah. And so here's just an example of how these uh, analog, or let, well, let's not say analog computer anymore. These early, early types of calculators, computers were used for different purposes. Uh, the one that's probably most known is the one up at the upper right, which was used, by the way, uh, in the 1920s, I learned that it was used, machines like this were commercial machines uh, that were invented in uh, Germany, used for commercial purposes. Uh, but by the 1930s, with the Enigma machine, they also, Enigma was a company, and they made uh, this machine for encryption and decryption. And then in order to decode those uh, encrypted messages, uh, the U.S. and British uh, worked on machines in order to... Um, try to decrypt the message. And you've got the American machines, as I understand them. Yes, exactly. That was the mach the movie that I'd forgotten about the name. Um, and the ones down, the one, the ones in the, in the United States were destroyed, but the one down on the bottom is a picture of one from uh, British. By the way, the word uh, bomb, B-O-M-B, -B, they, they come from the same word. Does anybody know why it's called that? That's kind of an, in fact, how come the explosive thing's called the same thing? How come there's a dessert called the same thing? That may give you a little more clue. <laughs> it, it, it refers to um, the I. Uh, no, actually, it refers to round. So what you have down there is those round um, cylinders. And so, uh, yeah, like that. There you go. And you, yeah, exactly. I, I'm always glad when they're, well, <laughs> maybe boom also, but uh, the cylinder. There you go. Perfect. That's why I like to have people from different uh, languages and cultures because uh, we usually can come to the, uh, usually share our um, knowledge. Okay. So in any case, um, you can see a reconstructed machine down there on the right. And essentially these things, as if you saw the movie, you can see them, you know, click, 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 and trying to reconstruct uh, or decrypt the message. Okay, and then up the upper left, you've got a uh, Norton, bomb, Norton bomb site. And what that one did was that was an analog device that told the pilot or the bombardier when to, well, bombardier really, when to release the bombs. And it was, uh, you had to have uh, wind and the um, uh, speed of the airplane and uh, where it was supposed to, bomb was supposed to hit and stuff. And so it was a more precise way to uh, 
bomber city than uh, they had before, uh, which was very imprecise. Okay, and then it brings us to this device here, which some people in the audience may have used. Anyone happen to use this? When I went first went into college, uh, I had one of these, not a calculator, because it was before electronic calculators. Uh, okay, yeah, slide rules. And there are various types of slide rules. Some are used for in airplanes, uh, or at least back early air, uh, airplanes, um, where you put in the wind speed and the uh, distance and the gas and all that. And you could figure out whether you're going to make it <laughs> or how much gas you had to have. Um, there's one down there on the bottom right, which uh, calculated um, nuclear radiation. Uh, an old one up on the upper left, and then one that is a more recent version um, on in the middle there, the yellow one. But these were invented back, they were used for 350 years, and they were invented, yeah, uh, back in the, um, until the 1970s when you had electronic calculators. Now, I'm going to show you something here. If you give me just a second, I'm going to pull something out from behind the screen. I built this earlier uh, this morning, and it's kind of cool, I think. Okay. This is a, you can do a copy of this. This is a working uh, um, slide rule. So let me let me pull it up a little bit further. I think you can get a copy of it. Let me make sure I got all the pieces here while I'm doing that, so it works. There's three pieces to it. If you want to uh, make a copy, and I'll show you how these worked. Um, yeah. Okay. There we go. So let me step back a second so I can see this thing. Okay. Okay, now, the other thing, by the way, if you uh, don't get everything the way I'm saying it right now, this, the uh, textures I had for, for making this come from here. And this, and you can actually see on this website that uh, you can move, this is a virtual slide rule online. And you can move the slider around and you can move the middle piece around the same way I'm going to do here in just a second. Um, yes, it was made in Japan, but... And apologies to people because this is, uh, at the time, this was not very, uh, it was considered insulting, is that if you look very carefully, it says made in occupied Japan. What that means is this was, uh, I had read, I read um, between the two time periods here that um, the U.S. forced Japan to put on about 50% of its goods, they had to put made in occupied Japan rather than made in Japan. And so apologies for that. I didn't even notice it said that until recently. Yeah, politics. Um, but um, in any case, let me show you how this works. And if you want to see a video for how this works, is you can go to a video I made uh, five years ago that show how a slide rule works. And I think I use this same one five years ago so that's kind of interesting yeah 2d digital representation of 3d object so let me show you how this works and what i'm going to do is i'm going to do a couple simple ones you can do logarithms and trigonometry and stuff but what i'm going to first do is i'm going to do uh squares cubes uh multiplying and dividing and so actually the squares and the cubes are rather easy and so th those i'm going to do first is essentially what you do let's do uh a, a 4.7 uh, uh, squared. And what I need to do is, let me see, get some windows out of the way here, and I got to zoom in. But what I do is I go to um, and adjust my camera control a little bit here so I could see things. Okay. So what I do is, uh, in order to make this work, is you go to 4.7. In fact, let me put it in the screen since I got a, a little bit of time here. Because let's calculate uh, 4.7 to the uh, squared. So the first thing you do is you take your cursor and you um, put the cursor on 4.7 on the C scale. So the C scale is the 
one, the bottom one of the middle area. So let me see, I'll adjust this to 4.7 here. And then what you do is you can read it directly. In other words, right above it on the uh, scale that says a B scale, which is two ones up, or uh, the one, if, if this is the middle line right here, see? Whoops, not that one. You can read it and it says 22. And indeed, 4.7 times uh, 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 squared is uh, 22. Um, the other thing is like if you wanted to do 4.7 cubed, you go up to the B scale on here, which is the, or excuse me, K scale. So what you do is 4.7 on D here. And then you read 1.04 on the K scale, which is uh, above that. Yeah, you can actually go back and uh, look at my uh, video, and I, I do the same thing in my video here, or play with it yourself. And the reason, and then it says 1.04, but since basically if you uh, kind of, you have to use your head a little bit, but if you go 5 times 5 times 5, that's 125, so 10. 1.04, it must be really 104. In other words, people had tricks like this in order to um, to make it, uh, uh, to come up with the right calculation. Remember that uh, slide rules were not for precision, but you could have at least a, what's called a, a three significant figures. In other words, at least two or more significant figures, two decimal places in some cases. Um, so let me also show you say how to multiply and I'm going to put the text on here so you can follow it because this is a little bit harder but if you want to multiply 2.3 times 3.4 uh, the first thing you do is you line everything up like it is and then you do 2. Point, you find uh, 2.3 on the um, D scale by moving the little cursor here so let's move this to uh, 2.3 on the D scale, which is right, let's see, right there. Okay, got it. Now, this is a little little trick here. Follow it here. Um, is what we're going to do is we're going to move the center, not the slider. And so what you do is you move the 1.0 part. This is for doing that 1.0 in order, and you move it down to where it's over 2.3. So let me see. I've got to zoom in to look at this thing. Okay. Do, 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 do. Yeah, okay. So where it is right there, 2.3. Got it. And then you go over to the, um, you move the cursor to 3.4. See, if, I, if I'd done this every day, it would be the same way as people do uh, stuff with CAC or with um, computers these days and you wouldn't have, it wouldn't be as awkward as I'm doing. In other words, this would be just second nature the same way we do with computers these days. And then you move it over to 3.4, which is, where's 3.4? 3. Uh, well, there's pi. The 3.4 must be there. And then you read down and lo and behold, if you actually look at the number, it reads 7. Point Um, actually, let's see, am I reading this right? 7.8 on the line D, okay? And that is the answer to what we want. In other words, we're multiplying 2.3 times 3.4. Okay, let's try one more. And what I'm going to do is the first thing you do on most of these ones is you, um, go to the middle scale and move everything back to where it all lines up on the left there. So we line everything up here on the left. Got it. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to divide 4.5 by 7.8. And so what we do here is kind of backwards a little bit, but essentially you put the cursor on 4.5 in the D scale, <laughs> uh, where's 4.5, looking for it, uh, 4.5 the D scale, which is here, um, 
There's five, yeah, 4.5 on the D scale. And then you move the middle bar so that 7.8, the one we're dividing by, is um, over the top of that. So I've got to move this so that 7.8 is over the top of that. Let's see, where's uh, 7.8? Eight is over the top of that and if you read carefully over here you'll see that the answer comes out as let's see 5.65 or 5.66 or so and the actual number is uh, point five, yeah point five seven six I think if I if I did it right or close to it um yeah so you can actually read to a couple decimal places or even two or three depending about three significant figures which is pretty cool you know i think that is 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 most cool particularly if all you needed was somewhat of a uh a rough um uh answer okay so now um so that was used here again i i like i said i used it <laughs> when i was um uh, first going to college Okay, now let's uh, take a look then about how let's take a look at, uh, about how computers are used today. In other words, the modern computer, digital computer, and really it's quite simple. Uh, see if you can follow this. Otherwise, what I'll do is I'll do a uh, one of the people asked me for a presentation on logical circuitry and how computers work. And so let's take a look. Is that um, if you look at the upper left-hand corner, you'll see that back in the 1600s also, and actually the, I think his name was mentioned earlier, is that uh, uh, von Leibniz um, co-invented calculus with Isaac Newton. One was in the UK, one was in Germany. They co-invented it around the same time. I mean, they couldn't just chat on their iPhone or, or you know, um, uh, do uh, Twitter or something. Uh, they, they weren't probably sharing information like that back in those days. You had to go, oh, hey, did you hear this or whatever? Wow, that too. <laughs> so, so, but essentially they were playing at the same time with this stuff. And But also uh, von Leibniz uh, invented uh, kind of binar binary arithmetic. In other words, the ones and zeros. Well, long time later, uh, what is a one or a zero? Well, one or zeros can be portrayed in lots of ways. But um, uh, one way we look at it is basically electro electricity on or off. In other words, a uh, one can be electricity on and off is a zero. The way we often look at that is because a transistor will, with a little bit of electricity, will allow electricity to go through it. So essentially that becomes a one and... Uh, if electricity doesn't go through it, it becomes a zero. But ones and zeros are also portrayed in uh, hard drive, for example, as magnetic direction of the particles. And so it's not always um, um, electricity. But uh, for the most part, you can kind of think of it as one equals on and zero equals off. Um, but... This slide is also showing you that just the simple idea of ones and zeros can represent very complex information. So how does that work? Let's take a look real quick. If you look at the slide, you'll see on the bottom left, see if you can follow this, is when we say 45, what do we mean? In other words, 45, yeah, it is. <laughs> so if we say 45, what do we mean? That What we mean is, there is we have a numbering system, a decimal. Let me see if I can do this in text. Decimal system. And so we have, uh, say, uh, ten thousands column and the one thousands column and one hundreds column and tens column and ones column, which are really just uh, multipliers of ten. In other words, uh, if you go from the right to the left, it's just 10 to the 0, 10 to the 1, 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4. Uh, or did I mix? Uh-oh. I'm 
missed one in the 10 to 0, 10 to, oh, up, I missed the, uh, let's see, 10 to 0, 10 to 1, 10 to 2, 10 to 3, 10 to 4. Okay. Um, yeah, exactly. And if you understand uh, converting one to another, then that's fine. And then things like hexadecimal and whatever don't throw you. But if you don't, it can be, I know it throws my students. <laughs> so the idea is that what is 45 in a computer? Well, there are no fours and fives in a computer. There's only ones and zeros. So how do you do that? So essentially, you then have to, con so for binary, you have to uh, have basically um, two, in other words, series of two, like 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, and 1. And so if you have a number like 45, you take the highest number that can go into it, in this case, 132. So you go 30, okay, so now you have uh, 0 times 64 plus 1, let's see, I'm going to do it in text, 1, i got to watch my time too, times um, 32 plus 0 times 16 plus 1 times 8 plus 1 times 4 plus 0 times 2 plus 1 times 1, and that equals to 45, which what that means is that in a computer, 45 is stored at as um, 101101. And all numbers are stored that way in computers. Well, it's not just numbers that are stored in the computers. In other words, in the early days, all they used was numbers. But what if you want to represent your name? In other words, how is a V or an I stored? How is a character from another language stored? In other words, um, let's see. Let's see if this will... Do this for me. Do, 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 do. Yeah, okay. So, for example, how is this stored in... Uh-oh, it didn't, it didn't do it, because on my computer it didn't do it. I was trying to do Thai uh, language, because up on the upper right are the uh, some Thai letters. So how are those stored in the computers? Well, you've got the idea is ASCII was uh, the table that was invented in 1965 to store uh, basically European languages. But uh, there's a lot of other languages other than European languages. So in the 70s, 80s in particular, you have a, um, a storage called Unicode, which can, with more ones and zeros, uh, it can represent up to 110 different languages. And so that's essentially how a letter is stored in uh, the computer. So, great. Uh, how do you store a letter? You just store it as a pattern of ones and zeros, the same way you store a number, except it's used in context. Uh, the same way you do arithmetic operators, like that one, that's stored as just a bunch of ones and zeros. But how do you store colors? Okay, who's an artist out there? How do you create a color? Like purple or something. I want to make sure everybody's out there because I'm staring at the board and not you guys. Yeah, okay, so what is that? What do, you, what do you mean by RGB values? Yep, combined base colors, exactly. Okay, so you'll see down at the bottom right that in a computer, all the colors are stored as um, numbers. Now, the reason why you have FFFE64 or D96 or something like that is that is simply another numbering system, which is base 16, hexadecimal. And those are really just numbers, it's just that they're shortcut ways of representing the numbers because the numbers are basically eight ones and zeros, uh, or a decimal number bigger. And so it's just, a, it, so colors in a computer are just stored by the intensity, of how much red, green, or blue you have, exactly. Base colors, hue, and saturation. So uh, you just store them as a bunch of ones and zeros. Uh, you beginning to get a pattern here? Is it uh, <laughs> everything in the computer? Okay, I have about a minute. So how does how are sounds stored? In other words, how are you able to hear me right now? Because it's the exact same thing.
How it, what is a sound? A sound is frequency, exactly, frequency uh, plus, well, in this case, uh, frequency because a wavelength is a distance rather than a times and intensity, so to speak. In other words, uh, amplitude. So all we're doing is just assigning numbers to the frequency and the amplitude and then sampling them about uh, very often, 14,400 times a second for CDs. Uh, and that is sounds. Okay, so now you know everything about how a computer works, yes? <laughs> okay. And that is my presentation for today. I hope you uh, enjoyed that. I'll be glad to answer some questions um, or comments or such. I try to hold it to an hour. If you want to know more about computers and how they work, I'll, uh, somebody said, yeah, I'd love to know computers, logical circuits, that stuff. And I'll be glad to show you exactly how a computer works also next time. Of course, you guys are always, uh, can stick around as long as you want. <laughs> I need to kind of wander off to uh, first life, but uh, I appreciate you being here because um, I this would mean nothing if I'm talking to myself. And I learn a whole lot from uh, people from all over the world. <laughs> I mean, that's why I'm here, really. Yeah, uh, because people are all over the world. One thing I can't change is the world's round and there's time zones and... Uh, yeah, please. Uh, I think you can. Now, what you may have to do is, oh, hi, is you, what you may have to do is to, uh, there's three parts to the it, so you may have to get all three parts. Make sure you get all three parts, but, but you're welcome. I'll just keep it up there, uh, and you can get copies to it. Now, remember, this is just one type of slide rule. Uh, in a lot of slide rules, what you have to do, like this one, is to, but you can find that at you, in other words, you can find a lot of different types of slide rules right here, and you can even make your own and stuff. But uh, remember that, for example, there are scales for logarithms. There's scales for lots of different things. And sometimes you have to do one thing on one side, flip it over, and get the answer on the other side. And so they're a little more complicated, but you can... Um, it's kind of cool. <laughs> okay. Um, have fun. I appreciate it. Thank you.
Let's do a lot of such lectures like a college in Second Life. It would be interesting. Yeah, I think so too. The courses, the small courses and all the lectures would be just great. Maybe second life year will be like next month, I don't know. After July next year, is it a joke? <laughs> <laughs> 